The Power of 500. To start off with, I want to tell just a little bit about myself so you know where I'm coming from. About six years ago or so, a friend and neighbor of mine invited me to a class on the U.S. Constitution, which he informed me would be held in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> and so I showed up. <laughs> and there's, there's a lesson here. That's a great way to get people to show up to a meeting. If you hold it in their home, they usually show up if they're at all friendly with you. And in this course, we studied the Constitution one night a week for a number of weeks. And two things that it really solidified for me. Number one, that most of the problems our nation is facing today are because we're not applying the Constitution anymore. Yeah. That a return to the Constitution would almost overnight solve most of the problems we're facing. The other thing it, it created for me was this passion, a passion to learn these principles of the Founding Fathers and to do something to get us back to it, desperately looking for a solution. And it wasn't af until after a while of being a member of the John Birch Society that I realized what I had joined. And so this afternoon, I'm going to share with you some of what I discovered, that maybe I'm a slow learner. It took me a while to realize all of this. But the first thing, just kind of going back to what I discovered through that constitutional studies, and that is that our nation really is not following the Constitution that all of our elected officials swear to uphold. I will compare this to, for example, I often teach about how Congress has specific enumerated powers. They have a list of powers that they can make laws regarding. And if it's not on the list, they don't have the power. Now, you take your car into the auto shop to have the brake pads changed out. They're getting a little thin. The computer on the, on the car tells you it's time to change your brake pads. So you take it in and say, I'd like you to change out my brake pads. What did you just do? You gave the auto shop some specific enumerated powers for what they can do to your car, right? And that's usually pretty well understood. And when I come to pick up my car, I hardly recognize it. It has a new paint job, a new stereo system. It's been turned into a low rider and they didn't change the brake pads. Well, you just, you just uh, employed the US Congress auto shop because <laughs> that's exactly what they're doing. They are ignoring the powers they're supposed to be doing, such as declaring war before we commit troops to war or coining money. They're ignoring the powers they're supposed to be doing, changing the brake pads, and yet they're doing all kinds of things we never authorized them to do. This is my simple state of the nation explanation that uh, at least 80 percent of what the federal government's involved in today is not authorized by the Constitution. When we talk about trying to balance the budget, just imagine for a moment if we were to trim back the federal government by 80 percent. Do you think we could balance the budget? And this really sums it up, Congressman Pete Starr, where he says, in this country, the federal government can do pretty much whatever it wants to. And he's right, unfortunately, because we're letting them. They get away with doing pretty much whatever they want to. It's not legal, it's not authorized, it's not constitutional, but yes, they do, don't they? However, there is definitely reason to be excited, encouraged, and hopeful for the future. Some of you might have noticed in the last couple of years there's been a little bit of an increase in excitement about liberty and the Constitution across this country. New freedom groups starting up all over the place. This is definitely something that's encouraging. We've seen this happen before, though. We've seen cycles where Americans start to get excited about and enthusiastic about a constitutional movement again, and then it kind of dies down, and then it picks up again and it dies down. The question is, are we going to be able to turn it around this time? Are we going to keep this movement alive long enough to actually save the nation and turn the course that we're on? Now, to add to that, a statement from Robert Welch. He's the founder of the John Birch Society. In our bulletin back in 1970, the first half is encouraging to me. There has been plenty of energy and enthusiasm and money expended by patriotic Americans to have stopped the enemy several times over. The discouraging part now follows. Most of it, however, has actually and cleverly been shunted off course or guided in support of the very things the enemy wanted to accomplish. 
If we'd stop shooting ourselves in the foot, basically, we can win this thing. First thing we have to ask ourselves is how do we solve this problem? Well, what's the root of the problem? If you go to the doctor and you're not feeling well, you tell him I'm not feeling well and that's all you've told him, and he says, well, what you need is this prescription, have a nice day, and you go home. How likely is that solution to help the problem? He doesn't even know what you have. Unfortunately, all too often I see freedom groups that are giving solutions that ignore the diagnosis. Are any of these the root of the problem? None of them really, right? If it was Obama, we had no problem before he was elected. And at the end of his one or two terms, whatever it turns out to be, problem solved. I wish it were that easy. But unfortunately, they are not the root of the problem. They're just symptoms. That when we're electing someone like a Nancy Pelosi, she is a symptom of her district. She's a symptom of the understanding of her district. And when we keep electing people like that, that is a symptom of the state of the nation, how much we understand who we're electing and what that leads to. This is probably the best way I can illustrate what is the solution and the symptom at the same time. How many of you are familiar with this gentleman, Alexis de Tocqueville? Famous French philosopher, author, and so on. He came to America in the early 1800s to discover what? What made America great? I have right there the answer. This statement from his writings really sums it up to me because he's describing when America did not have the problem that we have today. Think for a moment and apply this to today where he says, in America, every citizen is taught the history of his country and the leading features of its constitution. It's extremely rare to find a man imperfectly acquainted with all these things. And a person wholly ignorant of them is sort of a phenomenon. Does that sound like today to you? Yeah. Let's apply this to today for just a moment. Looking at the second half, we'd have to say today it's extremely rare to find a man even vaguely familiar with these things. And a person wholly educated on them is sort of a phenomenon. That's it, isn't it? If we had a society that we could describe that way, where would our nation be today? Would we be electing people like Obama, Pelosi, and we could talk about the other side of the aisle that's equally destructive of our liberties, whether it be Bush or we can name all kinds of names. Let's, Gingrich, one of my favorites. <laughs> Globalists in general, those that are working against the principles of our founding nation, the founding of our nation, excuse me. They're all part of the problem, but the real root of the problem is that we, the people, don't understand these things. That when our elected officials come along with, say, the uh, Endangered Species Act, and because of that, we're going to force Montana to reintroduce wolves. If the people of Montana understood the Constitution, we'd look through it and say, you know, I'm having a really hard time finding where the federal government gets the authority to regulate wildlife. It's not in there, is it? We'd laugh at them and go back to managing our own wildlife. It has nothing to do with the federal government. And so many things are exactly that way. We see the federal government often saying, we're going to take certain parts of land and make it protected. Well, if that's my private land, they can't take it from me unless certain provisions are met. You look at Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. The first half of Clause 17 authorizes establishing a seat of government, Washington, D.C., 10 square miles. The second half says that such land in the states they can regulate if it has been purchased with the consent of the state legislature and it can be used for limited purposes. What are those limited purposes? Forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Where does wilderness area fall into that? And again, when the federal government says we're going to take your private lands, and this is an issue up in northern Montana right now, there's a number of farmers worried about losing some of their lands with a new wilderness designation. Should that even exist? No. If we understood the Constitution, the limits of power the federal government has, when they come along with one of these proposals, we would just laugh at them. You don't have the power to do that any more than Mickey Mouse does. Go back to what we authorized you to do. 
Imagine that society for a moment. And we've pretty clearly identified the root of the problem, haven't we? Now think about this for just a moment. No solution is a solution unless it solves this problem. Is that fair enough? Anytime you see any freedom group or individual promoting a solution to the problems, just ask yourself, does it address and solve the root of the problem? For example, term limit. Very simply, let me ask you this question. Does it solve the root of the problem? Does it re-educate the people to elect better elected officials? No. If instead we have term limits and our society is completely indoctrinated in socialism, what do term limits do for us? They guarantee a faster turnover of socialist leaders. Does that help? No, not really. What about in a society that is like de Tocqueville described, where every citizen understands these things? What do term limits do for you then? What they do is they tie your hands. That when you have a rare individual like Jefferson, Madison, Washington, those rare ones come along and serve us in political office, we no longer get to keep them for term limits, send them away when we would desire to keep them. And we have to settle for the more mediocre candidate. Doesn't help us then either, does it? The next one, balanced budget amendment. If society is completely indoctrinated in socialism, what does a balanced budget amendment do for you? It raises your taxes. And yet if we were to refine the federal government to just those enumerated powers, the balanced budget becomes a reality. Not just by raising taxes, but by trimming. By trimming. You don't have to raise the taxes anymore to balance the budget. And frankly, any other amendment proposal always implies that the Constitution is the problem. If we have to have an amendment to the Constitution of any kind, then we're placing the blame, the root of the problem was the Constitution was somehow inadequate. My response to that is, how would you know? They haven't used it in my lifetime, right? <laughs> Let's try it again. It really worked well the last time we tried it. And Constitutional Convention being one of those methods. But a constitutional convention has the potential dangers of making changes to the Constitution with unintended consequences or intended ones. Either, ones are, either way, it's bad. The militant revolt, tax evasion, or revolution. The problem with this one, all three of them really can be lumped into this one thing, and that is none of these will work unless we're successful in rallying a major portion of society behind our movement, right? If we do a militant revolt, and there's a thousand of us, and we march on Washington. Who meets us before we get there? U.S. Army. And what are we considered? An insurrection. You look at Article 1, Section 8. I think it's right around Clause 14 or 15. I think it's 15, where it talks about Congress's duty to suppress insurrections. They would actually be exercising an enumerated power to stop us. Hey, at least they'd be following the Constitution. <laughs> But do you see the problem? Unless we have a major portion of society educated on the problem enough to take that kind of extreme action, we're just a little faction, a little rebellion that gets squashed. But if you're successful in getting enough people behind your movement because you have educated them, you don't need your guns anymore. You've already won. You don't need a ballot. Excuse me, you don't need a bullet. You need a ballot because you win now through the ballot, through peaceful means. And that's the same whether it's tax evasion or revolution or whatever it is, none of those work without most of the country behind you on it. None of those are solutions and none of those address the root of the problem, do they? We must be able to re-educate and restore the type of society that de Tocqueville was describing in the 1800s. That is the only solution. If we are reaching out to less than one in a thousand, are we going to restore the society that Tocqueville described? Are we going to win? Unfortunately, no. We have to educate ourselves first. I can't teach you what I don't know. But how do we now reach out to the community? This is what I was looking for when I joined every freedom group I could find, was how do we do that? How do we reach the community? How do we get outside of the choir? We must have well-coordinated teams to do it. 
One of the biggest detriments to the freedom cause is that we're all independent. That's really the problem, though. We're all so independent. We all want to work in our own direction, doing our own thing. And if we can pull a portion of the freedom movement together in a coordinated effort, we can win. What knowledge is needed? Sun Tzu, famous Chinese military general and military strategist, wrote the book, The Art of War. This is one of my favorite parts of The Art of War, where he describes how to win every time. The beginning, he says, it is said if you know your enemies and you know yourself, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. If you do not know your enemies, but you do know yourself, you will win one and lose one. If you don't know your enemies nor yourself, you will be imperiled in every single battle. Applying this to the freedom fight we're in today, what is it to know yourself? We must understand the Constitution and these principles of liberty our nation was founded on to know what it is we're fighting for. If we don't know that, how do we know when we've arrived? How do we know when we've won? We're going to have to know ourselves, our strengths, our weaknesses, and so on. To know the enemy is pretty clear as well. Who are those that are working to undermine the liberty of our nation? I, I doubt that there's anyone in this room that doesn't know. It's not a particular political party that we find people on both sides, both Republicans and Democrats, working against the principles of our founding fathers, working against the principles of the Declaration of Independence. One of the first things that attracted me to the John Birch Society was their publications, particularly the Freedom Index, which is the voting records of U.S. Congress, both the House and Senate, compared to the U.S. Constitution. What more appropriate standard to use than the Constitution itself? They all swore an oath to uphold it, right? The Freedom Index was one of those that, for me, was a life-changing event. When I first saw the Freedom Index, I would say that was one of the three most important political events in my life. I was living in Idaho at the time, and I thought we had good conservative congressmen and senators. And as I looked through here, not one of them had scored a 50% or higher on the issue I was first shown. And I was furious. They betrayed their oath. They betrayed us. And I, I made sure that everyone I could find heard about that. I shared the Freedom Index with hundreds and hundreds of people, probably thousands, because I was changed by it. I was moved by it. Other freedom-type materials that the John Birch Society puts out, the Overview of America, what a fabulous video for establishing some clear foundational principles, that we are not a democracy, and that democracy is a very dangerous word. It clearly shows that if we consider ourselves a democracy, we're destined to be ruled by a tyranny. That only a constitutional republic with the rule of law first, rather than the rule of the majority first, can preserve our liberty. Great DVD. The New American I have seen change more people politically, ment their mental political thought, than any other tool I've seen. A young lady I met a, oh, a year or so ago, when she graduated from one of Montana's most liberal colleges, she admits she was a committed liberal. <laughs> and she even said, I was probably a borderline socialist. And upon graduation, her uncle gave her a gift subscription to the New American Magazine. <laughs> and she began reading it. And after two years, she called our headquarters and said, please sign me up and get me involved. What can I do to help with the cause? She changed from being almost a socialist to a constitutionalist. Why? Well, her answer was, I never knew there was another option. Wow. I want you to keep that in mind, because as you look around at your neighbors, that you consider, oh, they're a hopeless, liberal, lost cause. Yeah. That may not be the case. Truth is extremely powerful. And in her case, totally changed her paradigm. She'd always been shown the big government solutions, the big government liberal solution versus the big government conservative, so-called, solution, but never the constitutional solution. And what an eye-opener it was to her. And that truth rang true to her. So don't give up on the liberals. They might take a little more time, a little more work. But anyone who is honestly seeking the best interests of our nation, truth can ring true to them and can change them. 
I have to briefly mention one of my favorites as well, Arthur Thompson's weekly review of the news here that we have on the Liberty News Network to get a little bit of a constitutional perspective and some understanding of what's going on behind the news headlines that isn't being reported in the news. I always look forward to that. It's found both on the jbs.org page where you can see the latest editions there. It's also hosted on the Liberty News Network page. But the John Birch Society has many educational tools to help us in this effort. American Opinion Foundation, the Freedom Project is working heavily right now on producing curriculum for schools and homeschoolers and so on, constitutional education and so on. Campus Liberty Alliance, shopjbs.org, place to purchase a lot of the materials we offer. Now to, to move a little bit forward here, talking about understanding the enemy, one thing we must understand about the enemy is that they are well organized. They are like an extremely well-seasoned army. And we, in the freedom movement, tend to be a lot more like lone rangers. And just honestly, what are the chances of taking on a very powerful army with a, a bunch of rogue, independent lone rangers and winning? Unless we organize and focus our efforts like they do, we don't stand a chance. Again, I'm not a joiner. Well, I don't care if you're a joiner. Is the future of your nation worth it? In, in the freedom movement, many are not well organized or educated. Many of them don't really even understand ourselves, using that analogy again. Many don't understand the principles of liberty very clearly, although I find they're generally very hungry for it. Other information that we've, we provide also helps expose the enemies, whether it be Agenda 21 or some of what's happening in the United States with China making investments and businesses moving into the United States, really giving China a foothold in many parts of our country. Great book on exposing terrorism, understanding what's really behind the whole terrorism network. And a great book, The Shadows of Power. Uh, this one was a real revelation as well, American Tyranny Step by Step, showing the process of how, for example, Hitler step by step rose to totalitarian power. This pattern being used over and over again throughout history and, incidentally, we're seeing it happening again here in our own country today. I will mention one thing. When we're talking about the enemy, we're trying to re-educate our communities. One of the most important things you can do is this. You must maintain your reputation. For example, if I start talking to you about the Illuminati, this book right here is called Proofs of a Conspiracy, published in 1798, that exposes the origins of an organization called the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati. If I come to you and I start telling you that there's this Illuminati organization that's trying to take over the world and they're this alien race of reptilian shapeshifters, I might sound just a little bit loopy, right? you might start to think that whatever else I have to tell you is also equally crazy. And I've discredited myself. It's vital that we stick to well-documented facts and stay away from anything that's speculative when we're talking about the enemies who are trying to overthrow freedom. That theme has happened all throughout history. There have always been tyrants that have been trying to gain more power over people. Nothing new. But we must stay away from the speculative and crazy sounding stuff if we're going to expect anyone to listen to us. Another publication from the John Birch Society, the bulletin is made available to those who are actual members. And it really is the instructions for what chapters should be focusing on. Back when I first joined the John Birch Society and had no clue of what I was doing, Dale Pierce appointed me as the local chapter leader. Yes, I understood, and I had been studying intensely the principles of liberty and the enemy. But when it came to wisdom of how to apply that knowledge to effective action, I had, a, I had no clue. It literally became my prayer on a regular basis. Please, Lord, guide me to wisdom to know what to do and how to do it. And for about five months of being the chapter leader, that continued to be my search and my prayer. And then one day, I was sitting down and relaxing in my office, and I picked up the bulletin, and I read the thing cover to cover for the first time. And I went running into my wife when I was done, and I said, Eve, have they all been this good? <laughs> and she looked at me kind of scoldingly and said, what, you haven't been reading them? <laughs> what a fool I felt. But that was what I was looking for. 
here was the wisdom I was looking for on how to run an effective organization, what to focus on, how to do it, and so on. How do we reach outside the choir and reach the rest of the public and effectively re-educate them? Should we go talk to NBC and say, you know, I've got some great information you guys would love to share? <laughs> That's not going to work, is it? Some of you might realize they have a little bit of a slant and it's the opposite of our direction. What about the public schools? Uh, sometimes, sometimes some of the local schools are very favorable to showing overview of America in there, for example. We've had some of them thank us for bringing it to them. They loved it. But by and large, no. In general, the public schools are geared against us. This is the core. This needs to be the theme that you remember. Whatever actions we take, we're always seeking to build our influence in our community. Don't worry about what's going on in the next town or the next state or across the country. Because when you restore liberty in your community, that's the, the puzzle piece that you need to put in place. Building influence is the focus. Now I'm going to show you what we found to be some of the most effective ways to build influence. They're not the only ways. This also came from our bulletin, where I found all kinds of wisdom. This is one of the most encouraging things I've ever heard. It costs a great deal more money to lie to the people and organize them into enslaving themselves than it does to tell the truth. It probably takes one dollar for every thousand dollars the insiders spend to undo insider propagated falsehoods with truth. Sometimes that ratio is even greater. An example, that young lady I just mentioned where a gift subscription for two years to the New American Magazine totally wore away, destroyed all the propaganda she'd been fed with just a subscription to a magazine. Does that $1 sound true to you based on that? Yeah. A $1 DVD can do an immense amount to unravel the, propag the propaganda that we've been fed. Now I'm going to talk to you about one of our most effective programs, the 110-6 program. First of all, the 100 portion, each member of a local chapter of the John Birch Society, each one of us takes the personal responsibility to target 100 households with information. Four times per year, distribute things like the Freedom Index. If everyone in your state had been reading the Freedom Index for the last five years, in here what we have is 20 mini lessons on applying the Constitution to current issues in every edition of the, the Freedom Index. Two issues of this per year. Imagine that, 40, 40 mini lessons every year for five years. What does that come to, 200? many lessons over the last five years. If everyone in your state had had those, tw those 20 lessons every six months, I'll tell you what, you only read a few of these issues before you start to recognize what is constitutional. And you can look at the title and already know without reading, oh yeah, that bill's an unconstitutional one. You start to know how to apply the Constitution. Everyone needs that knowledge. On average, most of the time, if I share the Freedom Index with a household, I've reached the husband and wife. There's usually two potential voters there. And if they even shared it with one other couple, how many people have you reached? Four. And we find that that's probably a low estimate per household reaching four potential voters. That uh, distributing to 100 households, we're probably reaching at least 400 voters. 400 voters times, let's say there's just 10 of us in our local chapter. Those 10 are potentially reaching 4,000 voters. I'll talk about Montana for just a moment. In a state legislative district in Montana, a Senate district. If I am influencing the votes of 4,000 voters, how am I doing? In one legislative district, most legislative districts have about four or five, maybe 6,000 voters total show up to the polls in a general election. And if we're influencing the votes of 4,000 of those, might that be enough to sway an election? And if you have a chapter of just 10, Doing that in Montana, we have only 50 Senate districts. What's our numbers looking like here? 10 people, 10, uh, 50 chapters across the entire state. You've got a team of 500 people, don't you? 500 people in those chapters reaching 50,000 households and roughly 200,000 potential voters. How many people voted in Montana's last general election? It was a little over 300,000. If we're influencing 200,000 out of 300,000, might we have an influence on the next election? Yeah, you certainly could. But that's not all. The 10 is reaching out to opinion molders. 
And done right, I think that the opinion molders part is more influential than the 100. The 100 is very important. It's a little bit of a shotgun approach, reaching out to 100 households on a regular basis. And the key to both of these is the repeat exposure. The first time you give this to someone, someone, some people will react like I did and love it. Other people will look at it skeptically the first time. The second time, they might have, their wall might come down a little bit. And little by little, after seeing this over and over again, it becomes a household name. That's how we start to change the mindset of people in our community. The repeat exposure. That means that this is not an overnight fix, doesn't it? That means if we work on this, we're going to focus on this for six months. Oh, man, we're not seeing any results. You're not supposed to. Keep going. <laughs> Give it a year or two or three, and you'll start seeing results. But this is a long-term commitment. This is a long-term problem. Now, the opinion molders, the opinion molders is a different attack, a different angle. We want to choose 10 people in our communities that are people of influence, whether it's an elected official, someone who, who's maybe a talk show host on a local radio, newspaper editor, prominent business owner, might even be a plumber who's very friendly and in doing his house calls, he's just talking to everybody. I don't care who it is, it's, you're targeting these 10 people because of their influence. One of my favorites on this list is pastors. How much influence does one pastor have? How many households does one pastor influence? Done right, the 10 is going to be more influential. But we're working on any angle of attack we can use. Now with that, I can't give you any kind of numbers of what the 10 opinion molders is going to reach. Much more than the 200,000. If we're trying to reach out to the 300,000 voters in Montana, between those two, can we do it? Can we turn around Montana doing that with 50 teams of 10? Absolutely. And in the process of that, from time to time, you'll find that there's a few people that step up and say, I want to know more. I'm hungry. I want more information. I want to know what I can do about it. They become one of your six prospective activists, people to join your team, people that can help with what you're doing. You don't have to stop at 10 people, by the way, in your local team. We don't have to stop at 500 in your state. When I talk about 500, that's 500 for any, le any congressional district. Any congressional district in this country, you put one person in there working full time. Do, how, where are my coordinators? Are they in the room right now or are they out? Do you, you want to stand up for just a moment? I'm going to pick on them. <laughs> Thank you. Now, these gentlemen, what they've agreed to do for us is to work full time building a team of 500 in their congressional district they're assigned to. Uh, Eldon Stahl is assigned to South Dakota. Eldon <laughs> Thank you, Eldon. South Dakota has one congressional district. Chris Stevens is assigned to North Dakota, which has one congressional district. <laughs> and then Jeff Hymas is assigned to Wyoming, which also has one congressional district. Build a team of 500 in each of those places, and what do we do? We turn around those states. Uh, stepped out of the room is Michael, Michael Boyle, who's in charge of Montana. That's what it takes. It simply takes hiring one person, sending them to a congressional district, and say, build a team of 500. And honestly, you could drop me anywhere in the country, and I could, have, I could build a team of 500. And if you have anyone who's willing to build their local team, I don't care if you don't know anyone in that community. If you work what I just showed you, you can build a team of 10 or 15 or 20 to turn around that community. You don't have to know anybody. It helps, sure. Do you remember this event? 9 12 2009, a couple people showed up to Washington, D.C. By all honest accounts, it was probably somewhere between 1.5 million to 2 million. Some of the lower accounts, maybe a million people showed up. A few people showed up anyway, quite a few. Showed up to Washington, D.C. to do what? To protest an out of control government and demand they get back in line, right? And they didn't listen. What did they accomplish, though? They did not accomplish getting Congress to turn around. What they did accomplish, I would say, is feel good. We are not alone. That's it. That's it right there. We're not alone. You look around you, and there's a few million people around you that are also fed up with the direction our nation's going. Great, there's definitely enough people out there who are dedicated to this cause. For the 
two million that showed up there, how many didn't make it? How many couldn't afford to go? Yeah, exactly. Most of us. <laughs> There's far more that stayed home than, than showed up. Now, answer me this question. What would it cost for you to have gone? Do you think you could have gone and spent a weekend in Washington, D.C. for $500 or less? I'm going to use that number, by the way. It's at least 500, probably a lot more. Those that did go that I spoke to said 1,500, 2,500 or more. If we just said 500, and let's say there was only a million people there, how much was spent that weekend? Simple math, half of a billion dollars. But you see what I'm saying here? $500 million was spent on that weekend accomplishing we're not alone. What could we have done with that kind of money? Think about this for a moment. How many congressional districts are there in this country? 435 congressional districts. Divide 500 million. That means you have more than a million dollars to use in every district. That is far more money than we need to hire a coordinator for every congressional district in this country. What could we have done with even a fraction of that money? Hired every, a coordinator for every district? Where would we be today? If we had a full-time coordinator building a team of 500 in every district in the country, within a few years, having that influence of 500, educating and restoring the society that Tocqueville described, all of us can play a part in this, whether it's actively being part of that team of 500. Some of us may not physically be able to do that. Time constraints, health, or whatever. Some of us might be able to help financially with that. Some might be able to do both. Whatever the case, it comes down to really the spirit of our founding fathers who signed the Declaration of Independence. My favorite line of the Declaration of Independence is the concluding line. And for support of this document, with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, they knew they were committing treason in the eyes of King George. Firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other what? Our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Today, there are many that are committing their lives to this cause, putting the time in. There are many who are committing their fortunes to this cause, funding everything we're doing here, making this possible that we are right now hiring coordinators in many districts across the country. But lastly, our sacred honor. That's what all of us put on the line. I am willing to be called a right-wing wingnut, an extremist. What are the other names? A kook? A... There's all kinds of different names that they might call you, right? Some people don't want to join the John Birch Society because they don't want to be called a bircher. I say, get over it. Do you want to save your country or do you want to be called something nice? <laughs> Take your pick. Take your pick. I'm proud to be a, a member of the John Birch Society. We have stood for, we're now in our 53rd year fighting for freedom. And I can't tell you how many people come to me telling, today saying, I used to think you guys were crazy, but now I realize you've been right all along. <laughs> in conclusion here, I must bring in the founding fathers to back up what I've said. Thomas Jefferson being one of my favorite. He says, educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. He agrees with me, doesn't he? That the only way we can preserve liberty is through Educating not just our choir, but the whole mass, the whole community. All around you, look around the room for a moment. Around us in this room, we're going through the same thing that happened in the late 1700s, and many great men stepped forward. Names like Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, and so on. And around us today are similar men and women, stepping forward, devoting their lives to preserving liberty. One last quote from Jefferson and we're done. Jefferson declares, do you want to know who you are? Don't ask, act. Action will delineate and define you. I invite each of you to take part in this team of 500 in your congressional district, whether it be financially, spending your time, or any combination. Every one of us has something we can contribute to that cause. Thank you very much.